Hi, in this video we're going to introduce a new idea um, that we're going to start the next chapter with about vector valued functions. <clears throat> so before we get too far into vector valued functions, I want to just think a little bit about what you know about kind of ordinary functions. And so since algebra and through most of calculus you worked with functions y equals f of x functions, I want to kind of just think a little bit about what you know about that. When you think about functions, you've got inputs, and outputs, and um, for y equals f of x functions, our inputs are real numbers, maybe not all real numbers, it depends on the function, whether your inputs are all real numbers or just some subset of real numbers, and then your outputs are also real numbers. So if you think about a function like f of x equals x squared, right, you input a number, you square it, you get an output that's also a number. And so when we think about this set of inputs, we talk about things like domain and then the outputs range. And again, we may or may not have all of real numbers as some of our inputs or outputs. If you think about this function, for example, all real numbers are possible inputs, but your outputs would not be any negative real numbers, only zero or bigger. And you can think of lots of examples of functions that you've worked with before that have some subset of the real numbers as their inputs and some subset as their outputs. But the idea is that there's sort of this um, action that takes some sort of input and you do whatever to it and you get an output. And so that's what we call the function. So we want to basically just extend that idea to what we're going to be working with in the next chapter and really several times throughout the rest of the semester, uh, vector valued functions. So we want to start with these kind of same ideas uh, here that we talk about with inputs and outputs. Usually when you look at the definition of a function, you might not call them inputs and outputs. You might talk about domain uh, and something like that. So we're going to use some little bit more formal language over here. All right, so anytime we start with any kind of function, we want to talk about what are the things that go into that function, the inputs. So I'm going to talk about that here. We're going to say we're going to let D be some subset of the real numbers. It could be the entire set of real numbers. And we've used this symbol here to represent the set of real numbers. We use that when we talk about R1, R2, R3, Rn. In this case, D is a subset of R. That, me that might mean that D is all of R. Any set is a subset of itself. Uh, I use D here because we're really thinking about the idea of a domain. Okay, so the idea with a vector valued function is that we start with some domain uh, that is some subset of the real numbers. All right, and then a vector valued function and this sounds kind of funny perhaps if you're not used to talking in mathematical uh, jargon, a vector valued function on D. When we talk about functions doing something, they're increasing, they're decreasing, they're continuous or whatever, we talk about them doing that on a set. Here we'll talk about a function on the set. A function on the set D uh, is a mapping or sometimes we might say a correspondence. I'm going to use the word mapping here, but you might also hear the word correspondence uh, that takes Uh, every object in D, I'm going to introduce a letter here. When we think about ordinary functions that you've worked with before, uh, the objects in that domain, we often call those things X's. Um, but you can use other letters for that if you want. Uh, for vector valued functions, we often use T for a parameter. So every T that is in D, so T would be any real number in D, and pairs it with uh, one and only one, so I'll put here exactly one. I probably should say here each, not every. Each t is paired to exactly one. It doesn't mean all the t's are paired to the same one. Each t is paired to exactly one vector in Rn. Okay, and I underline that because you should notice that at that point, that's where what I'm writing down here for vector valued functions differs 
from what I talked about over here. So the inputs, the real numbers, are paired to, for ordinary functions, real numbers. Input a real number, you get an output that's a real number. But here, what we're describing is that we've got real numbers, which we use t to describe here, but those are paired to vectors. And we might have those vectors in R2, R3, wherever. So we'll just say here in Rn. Okay, so if I want to kind of draw a diagram here for vector-valued functions, the idea here would be that our inputs would be some subset of real numbers. Maybe not all real numbers, but some subset of real numbers. And instead of being mapped to another subset of real numbers, our outputs are vectors. And those would be vectors in Rn. All right, so this is what we're talking about here with vector-valued functions. Um, so just like you're used to some ordinary notation for ordinary functions, we often use f of x, but you know that you could use other letters. It's the same with vector-valued functions. There's some common notation that you'll see often, unless there's a compelling reason to use some other letters. These are the letters that we often use. So we often write something like r of t, Okay, sort of like we have f of x here. So vector-valued functions, the function name is often called r. It might be called v for vector, although often that's usually reserved for a velocity vector function. So we will sometimes use other letters if there's a reason to do that, but this is what our text and a lot of texts use for just an ordinary vector-valued function, r of t. Right? So that indicates that our t variable is our input, and then our output is going to be a vector. So we need some notation here that looks like a vector. So depending on, uh, I'll just write here for a vector in R3, but depending on whether in R2 or R3 or Rn, you might write that vector a little bit differently. I'll just write one here in R3, since that's mostly what we'll be working in. So when you write a vector, you're going to have components. So you're going to have an f of t in the i component, and g of t, j, and h of t, k. So we might write that vector-valued function like this, or sometimes instead of the i, j, k notation for vectors, we sometimes use those brackets and commas. f of t, g of t, h of t. But the main idea here is that your output is a vector. So you're talking about components. Um, we often use f, g, and h to denote these component functions, and so we'll talk about those a lot. Uh, these f, g, and h here are component functions. We'll look at some examples in the next couple videos so you can kind of get a sense of how to work with these. Um, but these are called the component functions, and you can maybe surmise that the properties that this vector-valued function has are going to depend a lot on what these component functions are. If these component functions are nice functions that don't have problems with issues related to domain or continuity, then you have a nice, nicely behaving vector-valued function. But if you have component functions that have some issues related to continuity or domain restrictions, then those are also going to be relevant for your vector-valued function. All right, so in the next video, we'll look at two different examples, one sort of easy and one a little bit more complicated just to get your head wrapped around what all this really means.